So growing up, I wanted to be a rock star, like literally a rock star. I dreamt of being a guitarist in a rock band. Now, due to lack of talent, amongst other things, that career move didn't work out for me. And that's okay. But to make up for it, I did dress as my favorite guitarist during Halloween. Does anybody recognize who I'm dressed as? Yeah, a few of you? All right, that's awesome. Now, I was born in India and grew up listening to a lot of music and a lot of bands. But growing up, I never had the opportunity or the means to see any of my favorite bands play live. So I listened to a lot of their music, you know, through conventional means, tapes, radio, CDs, and so on and so forth. But I always wished I could see my favorite band live. Now, fast forward, and just a few years ago, my favorite band reunited, and I was able to see them in concert. And man, what an experience that was. I was all the way up in the front, yelling at the band, and it was the most beautiful thing in the world for me. But that got me thinking. What if watching a band live at the concert was the only way for me to get exposure to their music? Could I have discovered the music back home in India? Now, the beauty of music is that the original song, once recorded by the artist, is available in many different formats and over devices. And you can listen to your favorite song, whether you're working out, you're cooking, or driving. So in short, as a listener, I don't have to go to the music unless I want to. The music is available to me wherever I am. And in the same fashion, being able to deliver amazing web content to your user, wherever the user is, that's leveraging the power of the web. And we'll dive into these concepts. So 30 years ago, exactly to this day, which is November 12th, Tim Berners-Lee, the man who would go on to develop the World Wide Web, he published a proposal for linking and accessing information over a shared interface. His proposal was to build a web of hypertext documents that could be viewed on a browser. Now, I remember my first experience using a browser. It was a simple process. You sat in front of a computer, you fired up the browser, you typed up the destination URL, you hit enter, and you got to your destination. And then when you wanted to do something else or access some other site, you followed the same process all over again. It was a deliberate, simple, and very linear process. And even if, as devices have changed, and we now carry mobile devices that can browse the web, the idea of going to a browser on your device is pretty much the same. But technology and user behavior has changed quite a bit. Now, today, the browser isn't the only way to access the internet or connect your users to your website. And we are in such an exciting age for developers with so many new devices and ways to engage with your users, all the way from tablets to desktops to phones to newer interactive uh, methods like uh, the Assistant. So thanks to the omnipresence of all these computing devices around us, we have entered an era of ambient computing. And so the devices aren't the center of attention anymore. It's the user. It's you and me. So how does web development evolve to address this shift? And just like in my concert example, it's unrealistic to expect that the band is going to re-record their music every single time a new content format or a new device uh, shows up in the market. But before we go ahead, let me just give a quick introduction. My name is Dave Gokte. I've been at Google for 10 years. Uh, and I lead a team of web solution consultants. And we work with developers like yourself to build engaging web experiences using the latest modern web tech. And it's really amazing to see some of the things our partners have built, the way they have completely transformed the way you buy movie tickets online, buy flowers online, or listen to music online, all using the power of the web. So what are the underlying powers of the web that make it so effective in today's environment? So I'm here to talk about how the web can be a key building block for building immersive user experiences based on its primary four superpowers. The web is capable, 
It's interoperable, it's embeddable, and it's highly transformative, and we'll dive into each of these concepts. But before we go any further, it's critical to acknowledge that we learned something completely new when we moved from desktop devices and started, started carrying handheld devices that could browse the web. We learned that you can't just be mobile first by taking your desktop content and just resizing it for a different screen size. And this is beside the obvious performance issues. Because the user's expectation of how they interact with the web has completely changed. I mean, we started with typing, keyboards and mouse, right? And with mobile, now we are all about tapping and swiping. And now we are on the cusp of the ambient web, with newer interactive patterns like the assistant and voice. And besides the obvious performance-related issues, as I mentioned earlier, these new experiences lead to a completely new user expectation. And a lot of this is based on how the users interact with real-life objects around them. So they expect a similar response. However, in my experience working with a lot of our partners, I feel like the web design process is still starts with the assumption that the user will go to a browser and then follow the steps that we have laid out for them. But then if we only think of website design in this, in this format, I think we are drastically underestimating the impact the web can have on our, in our lives. And we are undervaluing the complexity of a real user's journey. Now, user journeys are getting increasingly complex. And they are actually a lot more complex than even what our analytics or data shows us. Now, when we look at our analytics data, we might look at uh, data in terms of a user session or time spent on our site. But what is the user doing in between these sessions? Like, how are they even getting to the website? And it's important to think about that. Now, research shows that a digital shopper will have almost more than 100 touch points to the web. And this is right from the intent to purchase something all the way to discovery, research, to the actual process of buying. So people are no longer following a linear path from awareness to, to discovery to purchase. Now, OK. Now, let's look at a real life example. Now, I talked about my desire to be a rock star. So I want to look cool, and I want to buy a Gibson Les Paul guitar. So this whole process of me even thinking of buying a guitar to actually finding the perfect guitar to buy is long. And the journey is perilous. And it takes, could take me days and months or weeks to find the perfect guitar. And the process of research and discovery like happens across mobile, desktop, tablets, and could include a combination of web search, social media ad, remarketing ads, video research, and research on the retailer website. Now, let's say at the end of all of this, I find the perfect guitar that I want to buy. I go to the retailer's website, and I purchase. And the journey doesn't end there. Now I'm really anxious to get this guitar right in my hands. So now I'm tracking it, the delivery, right? Uh, maybe I'm using the assistant uh, to track the delivery, or I could use mobile web to uh, track the progress in the delivery. Now the guitar shows up, and I get a push notification. Now, whether it's obvious or not, oh, by the way, the guitar shows up. That means I'm also really, very excited. Uh, now, whether it's obvious or not, a direct browser or a version of a Chrome custom tab or a web view is part of almost every part of this journey, leading up to the event where the guitar actually shows up at my doorstep. And whether it's obvious or not, it's, and like the most interesting part here is it's not where I'm directly going to the browser to access the web. It's how the web creeps out of the browser and comes to me. So we don't have to go to the web anymore. I think the web comes to us as we move across devices, services, and even the assistant. So we are in a post-destination web. OK, so how did we get there? How did this happen? So let's look at the first superpower of the web, which is the web is extremely capable. Now, we all know that the web has evolved 
from a collection of static documents to a collection of highly immersive experiences. Now, the web can do it all. Now, whether it's subscribing to a podcast, watching a movie online, connecting with a friend, or just getting the right information at the right time. You can build highly engaging experiences and performant experiences that do exactly that. And if there's one company that really cares about giving their users great experience, it's Airbnb. Now, as part of its research, Airbnb realized that 65% of its first-time users land on its mobile web experience. And those same users expected all the performance and all the features of the native app without having to download the app. So Airbnb took this really seriously and invested in rebuilding its guest experience on the web. Now, they're already seeing some great results. They're seeing 23% improvement in conversion rates. But that's not the most exciting fact. Now, mobile web is the primary platform that Airbnb designs and develops for, instead of it being the last platform, and which also means that parity with native ensures that the design that they build for mobile web can easily be transformed and transported to other uh, platforms like Android and iOS, thereby reducing the overall development time. Now, at Google, we're always investing to push the boundaries even further by bringing newer technology to the web. Now, TensorFlow.js is a web-native implementation of the core machine learning functionality provided by TensorFlow, which is our software tool for deep learning. And this includes many, many prepackaged solutions, let's say, to classify images, to detect objects, detect body poses, detect language, and so on and so forth. Modiface, which is a Canadian augmented reality company, used TensorFlow.js to build a beauty product virtual try-on app for L'Oreal. And as you can see from this image here, it's highly interactive, highly engaging. It's a really good way to take a real-life use case and, and apply technology to solve the problem. Now, even emerging areas like augmented reality and viewing 3D models are now possible on the web. Yahoo introduced a web AR feature to distribute rich media content to all its users. They used the modelware viewer web component, and by using that, they were able to ship uh, AR mode with fallback to 3D for non-supported devices. Now, even though this is an early experimentation phase, uh, Yahoo is already seeing a huge uh, increase in engagement. They are seeing around 10% engagement, which is much higher when compared to non-AR mode. And they're also seeing a bump in conversion rates. So this is, going forward, going to play a critical role in enhancing the e-commerce experience uh, at Yahoo Shopping. And if you're willing to try this out, it only takes a few lines of code to try this out. And it works across, um, across platforms and frameworks. So I highly encourage you to try this out. Now, the second superpower of the web I want to talk about is the web's ability to be interoperable, or interoperability. Now, this speaks to the ability of the web to really render across all types of browsers. Now, this is not a new thing. We already know that a good web page renders and works across all browsers. But from a user's perspective, I think this is beyond a browser now. Now, your same web content can render in your favorite native app on Google Search or even the Assistant. So let's look at a few examples here. So as we have transitioned to a mobile first world, native apps are obviously very popular, and especially social media apps. And one specific format that's become increasingly popular is Stories. Now, for those of you who don't know, Stories is a highly interactive way uh, to share your experiences online by using a combination of video uh, and images. And if you're a verified user, you can even add a web link to your story. So in a way, your app now acts like a post-destination browser. And with one swipe up, you're able to load your web content embedded within the app in a, Chrome, in a Chrome Custom tab. Now, imagine if these pages were actually built for this type of handoff. How efficient and cool would this would be? OK, let's look at a different example, the assistant. 
Now, one of the amazing things about the Google Assistant is you can now use your voice to find interactive uh, or immersive services and experiences. And if you want more control over this experience, you can even write a dedicated action like Walmart did. And as you can see here on the screen, you can search for objects or things, in this case, it's Apple, and add it to your shopping cart. And when your shopping journey is over, you can just click the link, which takes you, uh, or which deep links straight into their progressive web app at the point of checkout. And the progressive web app is hosted at grocery.walmart.com. And at this point, you transition to your normal touch interface and complete the checkout process. And this just works. It's the same URL-supported experience that you find on the web. Now, the Google Lens platform is an entirely new way for users to explore what's around them using the camera. And this makes a lot of sense because, let's admit it, it is hard to type into a search bar or a URL bar on your phone. Now, we recently partnered with Netflix uh, and the New York Times for a special lens experience in the print edition of New York Times. And as you can see in this image, um, there was a printed ad in the newspaper, and when you point Google Lens at it, it shows you a over, digital overlay. And when you tap the digital overlay, it takes you to additional content tied to it. And now guess what? This, is, this experience is powered by the web and opens up an immersive page using the physical world as your virtual URL. And due to the interoperability of the web content, Lens can now immediately surface your content that's tied to a visual anchor point. So in a way, it's your same web-hosted content, but which can be surfaced in new and engaging ways. So let's look at the next superpower. The web is embeddable. Now, in the previous examples, you end up in what looks like a traditional browsing experience, which takes advantage of the linkability of the web. But what if you want to embed content? So we think of embedding in really two contexts. What if you want to embed web content into other platforms? Or what if you wanted to bring native content and embed that into the web? The, I'm glad to say both these scenarios are possible. So let's explore a few examples here. Now, dynamic mail takes us to the next level by bringing modern tech like interactive AMP content into your email client. Now, it provides senders the ability to provide expressive and immersive content and deliver it to your email inbox, so much better than static, boring emails. And as a user, you can now interact with the content as if it was a mini app. So in a way, a user can now, let's say, browse through a carousel, um, click a link, um, click a link, submit a form, or click a button, all within the context of the email, and always have access to the latest information in the email. Now, we always knew that web content could be made available inside your Android app through web views. But what we are offering you is a much better way to do these things. So we recently announced Trusted Web Activities, and you've probably heard about all of it over the last two days. It lets content creators quickly integrate existing web flows and journeys in a full screen mode within Android, existing Android apps with all the performance and the assistive features of the Chrome browser. And as you might remember from all the other talks, there are a ton of other partners who have experimented with this and have seen immense value. Now, obviously, all of this should adhere to Play Store policies. So what about the other type of embeddability? Now, if the key differentiator of the web is its power of distribution, can you take native content and then leverage that power to distribute it widely? And the answer is yes, using WebAssembly. Now, WebAssembly lets you run your high-performance, low-level code written in C and C++ and run it within the browser in a much more efficient manner. And I think, again, you have learned all about it today. So WebAssembly also has broad support 
across many browsers and devices. So let's look at a few examples. Now, AutoCAD took their 35-year-old code base. By the way, that is older than the web itself. And is now running it in the browser uh, as a proof of concept. And it's going really well. Now, what an amazing achievement. And if, as a web developer, you're not that familiar with AutoCAD or you don't use AutoCAD as much, you might be familiar with Figma, which is a software that you use to design your web interfaces. Figma has been using WebAssembly to run their C++ code within the browser. And the biggest benefit Figma saw from using WebAssembly was faster load time. In fact, they are seeing 3x the load time after they switch to WebAssembly. OK, so let's talk about the last superpower of the web, which is the web's ability to transform. Now, as we have seen throughout this talk, the digital ecosystem is getting more and more complex. And it's no longer about worrying if your page can render in the browser. You now have to worry about platforms, apps, and new computing surfaces that all seek for your attention. So how do you keep up with this? And maybe it doesn't make sense to publish a dedicated UI for all of these surfaces. Your content might be universal, but your UI is increasingly custom to a particular surface. So it might be interesting to see how your published endpoints can be seen as separate entities, like, let's say, business logic, content, and UI. Now, in a typical web page loaded in a browser, all three are combined to form the user experience that you control. But you might have noticed that some of the markup that you use lets your content act independently. And I'm talking about structured data here, which is a way to mark up your pages so platforms like Google can better understand your content and can transform it if necessary. Now, the end result is that your web content, which was previously coupled with your UI, can be decoupled and transformed into a richer UI within, let's say, Google Search. Now, you, in this example, you can see snippets, events, and products, and many more uh, areas shown here with a very rich UI that shows up within Google Search. So in a way, this extends your presence beyond your core page. Now, earlier we talked about how the assistant can become a good referrer to your site. But what if you want to trigger a quick action before it even gets to your site? Now, what's neat about this ecosystem is that to enable actions on Google for your content, you don't have to create something from scratch. Because you already mark up your pages to describe your content, Google can automatically generate actions for the Google Assistant with a corresponding entry in the Assistant directory. So when users ask the Assistant for one of the available content types, the Assistant is able to serve it up easily. And now we are already doing this for podcasts, recipes, and news verticals. And as a site owner, now you can go to the console and claim your, uh, claim your site content, knowing that it has already been transformed for use with the assistant. OK, so as web developers, you have made huge investments in the web, in the web platform. So it's only logical that you should be able to leverage this when new markets or platforms open up. And there's a way to do that. Now, recently in India, we announced the Spot platform, which is powered by Google Pay. Our Spot is a digital front for a business that is created, branded, and hosted by the business, but powered by Google Pay. Now, users can discover a Spot online or at a physical location by scanning a QR code and transact with the merchant safely and securely all within the Google Pay app. Now, the good news is a spot is built using HTML and JavaScript. So as developers, you can leverage your existing investments in the web and transform it into a spot by just adding a few lines of JavaScript code. <laughs> Now, this makes it possible for a merchant to have a truly scalable solution while maintaining 
the consistency of your user flows across different platforms. And Google is not the only player who's doing this. WeChat lets you do something similar on their platform as well. So to recap the four superpowers, the web is capable. You can do almost anything with the web today. The web is interoperable. You build something work once, and it works almost everywhere. The web is embeddable. You can embed web tech into native platforms and bring native to the web. And the web is transformative. Your web content can adapt and seed new platforms. So now that we have discussed the main superpowers of the web, here are some things to ponder and reflect on. Are you building high-quality content? Are you building highly performance sites? Are you taking advantages of all the capabilities that the web has to offer so that you're creating the best experience for your users? Are you really designing for a post-destination web? Now, you know that users are accessing your site through all these non-conventional means. How are you ensuring that your site is interoperable and embeddable? Is your web presence modular? Are you designing your site in a way so that you can leverage your investments and apply it across platforms so a new technology comes in, you're ready? Now, you might leave CDS today and say, hey, this is all great, but I have to think of all this technical debt that I've accumulated and deal with all these performance issues. Now, it's not that different than the sound engineer at a concert who has to stare at this jumble of cables and try to like, make things work. But I ask that you leave that aside for a moment. Now, just like fans like me demand an amazing experience at the concert, we are on the cusp of the ambient web, and our users are demanding an amazing and immersive web experience from us. And as you probably learned over the last two days, there's tons of capabilities and tools that you can leverage. And now that you've learned about all the superpowers of the web, now the only thing needed is your creativity and your imagination. So I can't wait to see what you'll build. Let's go put on an amazing show. Thank you. <laughs>